So good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds on this lovely Thursday morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Forge. I'm the Academic Chair of the Department of Pediatrics here at the University of Alberta. And I would like to acknowledge that we at the University of Alberta are located on Treaty 6 territory, and we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I wanted to take a moment to introduce our distinguished panelists, and then I will introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, so uh, I wanted to start with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Rozalowski, who is our associate chair faculty and um, an amazing contributor, not just to faculty development in our department, but also to um, these grand rounds. So welcome, Liz. And Dr. Jess Foulds, who is, um, uh, the outgoing chair of our Pediatric Grand Rounds Committee. And I just, as a side note, have to say that um, this committee works incredibly hard to ensure that we have um, amazing speakers each week um, to educate all of us. And uh, Jess is also our General Pediatrics Program Director. So welcome, Jess. And then we have Lin Yang, um, who is uh, one of our amazing administrators who um, really keeps our grand rounds rolling, make sure that all of the technical issues have been addressed, that everybody who needs special access to, as a panelist, um, that is all happening and all happening in real time. So Lynn, thank you so much for all, everything that you do for us. And then it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. So we have Dr. Justine Turner, who you all know as a pediatric gastro gastroenterologist and professor here at the U of A. Um, she is a principal investigator for the Mincy Hoif, um, uh, which is uh, the Health Outcomes Improvement Fund and a provincial initiative um, for maternal newborn child youth um, strategic clinical network. And it's funded, this funded the Provincial Eating and Swallowing or PEAS project um, across Alberta. We also have Beverly Collison, who is a speech language pathologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital and research assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the Cumming School of Medicine, University of Calgary. She is the co-chair of the PEAS Standardized Practice and Education Working Group. We have Melissa LeChapelle, who is a registered dietitian and provincial practice lead for provincial initiatives and integrated services within nutrition services. Um, she co-chairs the PEAS Standardized Practice and Education Working Group and co-authored the Clinical Practice Guide and Family Education Materials. We have Mona Danda, who is an IT project manager at Alberta Health Services, um, and she has been part of various clinical initiatives, including this PEAS Clinical Pathway. She is also the mom of a child with a pediatric feeding disorder. We have Trisha Miller, who is one of three co-chairs supporting roles and implementation working group within AHSP's project. She is also a registered speech language pathologist. And we have Vanessa Steinke, who um, is, uh, has also been supporting the group and uh, will be advancing the slides um, for the presentation and dealing with all things IT in the background. So welcome everybody. We are so excited to hear from you. Um, I will hand over the microphone to you and then happy to come back and moderate the Q&A at the end. Thanks, Sarah. So good morning, everybody. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I am one of the PEDS GI docs here at Stollery, and I have a particular interest in nutrition and nutrition support. And I've been very lucky to be involved as one of the medical leads for the PEDS project that we're going to describe today. So as we go through, each of the project team members will be presenting and introducing themselves um, throughout the presentation. So these are our objectives today. Particularly, we want to introduce the PEDS project and show you the resources and tools that are available for your patients with pediatric feeding disorders through this project. And we're going to provide you with what's going to be a pretty rapid pace overview and hope that you might take some time after rounds to review some more information that's available on our PEAS website. So the Pediatric Eating and Swallowing or PEAS project is a provincial quality improvement initiative tasked with developing a clinical pathway to standardise and improve the care of children with paediatric feeding disorders as defined uh, by uh, Praveen Gode et al. in the article at the bottom. 
For this project, our target population has been children in the ambulatory care setting. Um, so we focused our resources on outpatient and community care, but many of these resources can be applied and adapted to other uh, care settings such as acute care as well. The project actually began with two world cafes that many of you might have actually participated in that were conducted in northern and southern Alberta. And the goal of the world cafes was to gather information from multiple stakeholders that included patients, families, SLPs, OTs, dietitians, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, social workers, administrators, and others on what was currently working and what was not working for the care of children with pediatric feeding disorders in our province. So these are some examples from the World Cafes of the issues that were concerning families and care providers. Uh, and even here, you can see that some key themes emerge around communication and who is providing what care. These were the major themes that were identified from the World Cafes. And interestingly, these themes were similar in their frequency across the entire province, regardless of whether people lived in urban areas or rural areas, regardless of whether they were north or south. So using this stakeholder feedback, we identified the need to implement strategies for the major barriers of access and navigation, roles and implementation, and standardised practice and education. So this is our PEAS website, which you can find at peas.ahs.ca. A priority for our project was to make the final products equally accessible to both patients and their families and care providers. So on this website, you'll find both patient and provider portals and information on finding services, screening tools for patients at risk of paediatric feeding disorder, the clinical practice guideline, some tools and forms, and the education materials for families uh, on multiple things, but including oral and enteral feeding and including information for families of tube-fed children on obtaining equipment and supplies. So to date, we've had 5,200 uh, users, 46,000 views since going live a year ago, and most of that audience is from Alberta, but we've also had some national and international uh, screeners on the website. And another great feature of this website is that it's mobile friendly. So as Sarah said, um, we want to acknowledge up front that this project was possible through funding from Mincy. Throughout our project, we've sought input from family stakeholders. And so to set the stage for today's presentation, I would like to introduce Mona Dando, who is going to share her family's personal journey. And what really has been remarkable for us in our PEAS project is that in addition to being the mother of a child with a paediatric feeding disorder, Mona is also an IT project manager for Alberta Health Services, and she helped us develop and launch our PEAS website. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Um, yeah, thank you. So this is a, a picture of my, my daughter, Isha. She's now nine years old. Uh, she did and still has some challenges with feeding and swallowing. Uh, to give a little background, Isha was born in distress and delivered via emergency C-section. She um, was revived at the Sturgeon Community Hospital and we were transferred to the Royal Alexandra in NICU for about for four weeks. There, she was to bed for the duration of our stay, and she was diagnosed with um, a heart condition, permanent hearing loss, and trisomy 21. During the first year of Isha's life, we, we felt very supported by the Down Syndrome Clinic at the Stollery, um, the Edmonton Down Syndrome Society, and the Connect Society for Children with Hearing Loss. We had lots of support and services. We had um, physiotherapy through home care. We had multiple SLPs. And then, of course, all of our specialists. Uh, we also had some referrals to programs at the Glen Rose for feeding and swallowing that I had declined at the time because I felt we were double dipping services. We, we knew, um, well, we noticed the way that she fed and how she, her intake looked different than our son. But um, I think since she had a developmental delay, I thought that was something she might just learn over time, just slower than her peers. But that just wasn't the case. At the time, um, I also didn't realize that swallowing was something we could seek intervention for. So one of the, the great 
outcomes of the PEAS website is the family resource section. It's catered to families like ours who are looking for information on feeding, and you can use it regardless if you actually have an official EFS diagnosis or not, which I love. Um, one of the great examples is this diagram for families. It quickly shows at a glance what types of clinicians might have played a role in Isha's journey and how each provider might have assisted us with her eating, feeding, and swallowing. I think access to this kind of information nine years ago would have prompted us to keep those appointments at the Glen Rose or at the least ask the right questions. Now, this is Isha in her toddler year. She did progress. She was growing pretty well. She was able to swallow foods if I covered them in something soft like yogurt or applesauce or ice cream, something sweet. But um, that method was not sustainable. It was really messy and cumbersome. But, you know, we did our best at the time. And so around that time, we decided to seek intervention for feeding. We were for a couple of reasons, we stopped going to birthday parties and um, we were getting a lot of unwanted advice from our family and friends. There was a lot of financial stress. Private therapy was costing us about $135 to $180 an hour and 60% of that was coming out of pocket. And although we were grateful to have the support, it was confusing because our clinicians would provide um, sometimes advice that would clash or misalign with each other. And we were left um, to choose with what to do. And that caused a lot of anxiety. And we didn't have anyone to help us with priorities. So all the clinical advice we got from all of our um, different organizations and, and therapists was always equal weighted and top priority. And so we just were always left feeling like failures. Now, the PEAS website's taken a lot of legwork and research that families like ours would have had to do on their own. The site provides patient handouts for families. Like I would have probably used some and could have used some advice on how to graduate her from or better graduate her from um, liquids to solids. There is a section on government funding and um, a really in-depth section about self-care and how to cope with depression and anxiety that many people face at that time. And then um, around when Misha was four years old, through word of mouth from other parents, we applied and we were approved for specialized services um, through FSCD. And what that meant for us was we had a multidisciplinary team. We had an OT, a behavioral consultant, an SLP, and an SLPA. And sometimes that amounted to about eight hours a week, eight hours a week of therapy, but it was just as such a positive experience for us. It was so effective. All of our clinicians knew each other. They worked together. They started off by looking at our family's goals and what was important to us as a family, not just as each, like looking at each as an individual. And so that was a very new concept for us. Before that, the focus was always on what's best for Isha. And that was just a healthier way of looking at things. Um, they helped us prioritize work on her goals in small bite-sized chunks. And that alleviated a lot of those feelings of failure that we previously experienced. We had a communication book. We did quarterly reviews that involved the entire team. And we could bring that back to our pediatrician and they could see our progress um, as those three years passed. Our clinicians shared their goals with each other before our appointment. So we weren't wasting like that valuable therapy time, just talking about what the goals were. So she, she experienced a great amount of progress in that those three years. We, we finally felt safe enough to, to place her into community activities with her typical peers without worrying she was going to choke or, um, you know, have an accident. <laughs> and so um, these are pictures of Isha that we took, she's now working on using utensils. And um, uh, so after three years of specialized services, we paused and we've tra transitioned her to community school. And so unfortunately it's not a collaborative approach there. We're not invited to meet with the school therapists and the teachers decide whether Isha finishes her lunch or if she misses playtime because it takes her a long time to eat and also to get ready. So they've got to make choices for her. And although we feel disconnected at school, we, we do use the same positive practices that we learned in our home. We've, over the last nine years, we've been exposed to many different types of care. And we know we've experienced the most success when we're part of a multidisciplinary team. 
that collaborative practice has really kind of helped us understand that um, like our family is an equally part of her care team and that we're actually experts on Isha in our own way. And it's okay to consider the big picture and family values when it comes to prioritizing her goals. So all in all, just that experience of collaborative practice and working together as a team has left us feeling much more confident as parents and empowered in terms of caring for Isha. And it's really completely flipped our outlook for the better. So thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you, Mona, for your insights. I think Mona's insights really do highlight many of the concerns that other families and care providers raised in the World Cafes around service delivery, delivery, including in particular silos of practice and around communication and around the central role of the family in goal setting. Okay, so what is a feeding disorder? So for the PEAS project, we use the conceptual framework outlined by Praveen Gode and co-authors in JPGN in 2019. This approach enables children with feeding disorders of all ages and developmental stages and of many different causes to be recognised. And it's focused on a multidisciplinary approach to etiology, diagnosis and management. This type of approach and the diagnosis of paediatric feeding disorders for um, for many children with developmental disabilities or multiple medical comorbidities, the majority of the children that you and I see with feeding problems, was actually hampered previously by predominantly psychiatry-based uh, diagnoses like ARFID, for example, being used in this field. These same authors have now gone on to obtain a US ICD-10 diagnostic code for paediatric feeding disorder, and we hope that that will come to Canada and that will also enable better recognition, funding, advocacy and targeted research for this population. So um, this is what I like most about the definition that's used here is that it recognises the interplay of these four multidisciplinary domains that are essential for normal oral, take, oral intake at all ages. So a child with a paediatric feeding disorder might have dysfunction in one or more or even all of these four domains. So let's briefly go through them. The medical domain... Um, relates mainly to cardiorespiratory functional impairments with feeding that includes obviously the risk of aspiration. So many medical specialties and allied health specialists have a role in this domain. The nutritional domain includes malnutrition, but it's important to understand that many children with paediatric feeding disorders do not have malnutrition, and others might be growing well and appear well-nourished, but in fact have limited dietary diversity and so be at risk of micronutrient deficiencies, or they might have to rely on supplements in order to grow well. So dietitians are often key to recognising and managing nutritional dysfunction. Feeding skill experts like SLPs and OTs help with the diagnosis and management of feeding skills dysfunction. And again, not all children with paediatric feeding disorders have feeding skills dysfunction, although all children with swallowing impairments or with dysphagia have by definition a paediatric feeding disorder. Psychosocial dysfunction refers to limitations in the child's interpersonal interactions and relationships around food and feeding. And again, it's important to understand how these domains can, can overlap. So, for example, a child with a feeding skills problem may very well act out during meals and refuse to eat, but they still have a feeding skills problem that shouldn't be labelled or dismissed as a behavioural problem. We have to be very careful to consider all four domains when we see, to, see a child with a, an identified clinical feature of any one of these domains. So there are also some exclusionary criteria. So these feeding difficulties cannot be explained by the family's cultural beliefs or practices, and they cannot be explained by fear of gaining weight or body image disturbances that would more correctly uh, be under a DSM diagnosis of an eating disorder. So it's been difficult to fully understand how common are paediatric feeding disorders because of the highly variable definitions that have been previously applied, and of course, because of the lack of a common diagnostic code. Regardless of definitions, though, these seem to be very common in paediatrics, and you will all be seeing these children um, probably on a weekly basis. So 25 to 50% of neurotypical children are said to have a paediatric feeding disorder at some point. And I would argue that if you include transient picky eaters, of course, this would be much higher. For at least 5 to 10% of these neurotypical children, the problem is severe and persistent. 
40 to 80% of children with atypical neurodevelopment might have a paediatric feeding disorder. And we, of course, commonly see paediatric feeding disorder in ex premies and children with severe comorbid medical illnesses. Good morning. My name is Beverly Collison. As introduced, I'm a speech language pathologist clinician scientist in the Department of Pediatrics at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. And I'm a speech language pathologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital. Together with Melissa LaChapelle, the Alberta Health Services Provincial Practice Lead for Nutrition Services, I have the privilege of co-chairing the PE Standardized Practice and Education Working Group. This working group, which is provincial in scope, is comprised of health professionals, physicians, and nurses. Over the past three-ish years, we have adopted, adapted, or created tools and forms for health professionals and educational resources for families. Melissa and I are really excited to join you this morning to introduce some of these supports to you. Let's start with screening. Screening for pediatric feeding disorder is a strategy used for the purpose of investigation. As an optional precursor to assessment, screening has potential to identify the risk of a pediatric feeding disorder so that infants, children, and youth may be referred for a comprehensive assessment. Screening by, by definition, is not diagnostic and outcomes do not provide information about feeding difficulty severity or best management. PEAS recommends the Feeding Matters Infant and Child Feeding Questionnaire. You see this on your screen. This remarkable online tool is available for families and practitioners. It leads users through a series of questions that use smart logic to arrive at a risk statement for pediatric feeding disorder. Importantly, as any individual works through the questions, each provides education about typical and atypical feeding and eating development. This tool can be used by you in advance of a visit, in real time in your office, or offline following a visit. If concerns are identified about feeding or swallowing, you can follow up confident in the content of this questionnaire. We invite you to check out a relatively recent publication describing the psychometric properties of the infant and child feeding questionnaire. You can find it on the PEAS website under Community of Practice. Assessment lays the foundation for planning appropriate intervention or management to improve quality of life. To guide a thorough feeding assessment, PEAS identifies five questions to be answered within the medical, nutritional, feeding skill, and psychosocial domains, and identify sources of dysfunction. Due to the interplay across the four health domains that Dr. Turner described, impairment in one domain can lead to dysfunction in any of the others. The questions are, is the current method of feeding safe? Is feeding adequate? Is feeding a positive experience for child and parents? <clears throat> is feeding appropriate for the child's developmental capacity? And is feeding efficient? These five questions, prioritized by safety, enable practitioners to better characterize the needs of heterogeneous patient populations and thereby facilitate inclusion of all relevant disciplines in treatment. Once a screen or assessment is completed, families and practitioners can visit the PEAS website where they will find a section devoted to navigating services. Let me show you. Here is the Find Services heading on the top banner. Click it takes you to the submenu, Alberta Health Services on the left. 
Finding services within Alberta Health Services can be challenging given various eating, feeding, swallowing programs across the province aren't consistently named. Please address this by compiling a service list within each zone. For instance, here is the Edmonton Zone Services. Important to physicians, this list contains links to the Alberta Referral Directory, which is Alberta Health Services' designated system of record for referral information. In addition to wayfinding for Alberta Health Services, services Pease also created a document outlining where to look and which questions to ask if families are pursuing private practitioners. This information can be found on the website under other providers and services. It includes links to various organizations where private practitioners might advertise or register their services. Aligning with existing Alberta Health Service Systems Navigation Supports, PEASE endorses the Alberta Health Service's path to care wait time targets, emergent, urgent, routine, for clinical and or instrumental assessments. As part of the, Q, the, QA, um, the QA initiative, PEASE has been tracking how the Alberta programs that offer services to children with pediatric feeding disorder are meeting the proposed targets. Let me orient you. Under the wait times for routine visits and wait times for urgent visits columns, you can see that many programs are meeting the targets 80% or more of the time, which would be our goal. On the far right, on average, across all of these programs, less than 30% of families surveyed indicated that they feel they wait too long to access care for their child with pediatric feeding disorder. Ideally, we would like that to be below 20% of the time for all programs, and this is an ongoing QI goal. With respect to pediatric instrumental assessment availability and wait times, as you can see, VFSS and fees are available in Edmonton, Calgary, and South zones. North and Central zones do not have instrumental assessments available within the zone. Generally, wait times for accessing instrumental assessments are between zero days to multiple weeks or months, depending on urgency. In the next section of providing care, Melissa LaChapelle will describe in more depth the differences between these instrumental swallowing assessments most often used in pediatrics. I'll now pass the baton over to Melissa, Provincial Practice Lead Nutrition Services. Thank you, Beverly, for the kind introduction. We will now take a look at the tools available to support you when providing care to children with a pediatric feeding disorder. The Clinical Practice Guide is a key resource that aims to provide evidence-based clinical guidance to enhance quality of life and improve patient safety. These are pivotal to quality improvement in a field that has clinical and ethical complexity and where very few guides and standards exist nationally and internationally. This guide provides information, guidance, and recommendations to support AHS healthcare professionals in making clinical decisions regarding the screening, assessment, and management of children with pediatric feeding disorder. The guide aims to facilitate a consistent approach to the provision of care as close to home as possible, facilitate communication and collaboration among healthcare professionals and with families by using consistent language, definitions, and strategies to assist practitioner decision-making, facilitate processes for quality improvement to optimize quality of care, health outcomes, and psychosocial outcomes for families. And it also offers clinician tips, tools, and training resources to support lifelong learning and education. I encourage you to take a deeper dive into the clinical practice guide by visiting the PEAS website after a session today. To find the CPG on the PEAS website, click on four providers, and then read more under the clinical practice guide header. 
Once we have assessed and identified a pediatric feeding disorder, we can facilitate goal setting to address concerns of the child and family and document these goals on the goal wheel. Interventions to achieve therapy goals will be more successful when planned in collaboration with children and caregivers. Management of a pediatric feeding disorder is multifaceted and should be grounded in evidence-based practice. In the CPG, you will find that there is a strong emphasis on patient safety as the first priority before engaging in oral feeding. Medical stability, facilitating safe swallowing, optimizing nutrition, appropriate seating and positioning, feeding skill development, feeding environments and routines, sensory processing considerations, oral hygiene, enteral feeding, and transitions all play an important role in the management of a pediatric feeding disorder. So today we'll, we will highlight a few sections and tools. Management of all medical diagnoses is crucial to the success of other interventions. If oral feeding is initiated prematurely, a pediatric feeding disorder can be exacerbated. Oral feeding progress can change from feed to feed and day to day, which requires routine monitoring and reassessment as depicted in the pediatric feeding care cycle as displayed on the previous slide. In children who have been medically unstable or non-oral for a considerable period of time, confirmation of medical stability by a physician for appropriate initiation of oral feeds is recommended. And we have listed a number of considerations in the CPG that suggest medical stability, which are listed here. Instrumental evaluation is conducted following a clinical evaluation when further information is needed to determine the nature of the swallowing disorder. An instrumental swallowing assessment is a dynamic evaluation of coordination, timing, and safety of swallow function. It is not pass-fail based on aspiration, and it should never be used only to assess for the presence or as absence of aspiration. Instrumental evaluation can also help to determine if swallow safety can be improved by modifying food textures, liquid consistencies, or positioning. The two most commonly used instrumental evaluations of swallowing for the pediatric population are the video fluoroscopic swallow study, known as the VFSS, and fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, known as a FES. These exams can be complementary and augmentative. And within the CPG, you will find indications and contra contraindications of both of these assessments, as well as their, as their respective advantages and disadvantages. For infants, thickening drinks and liquids slows the flow rate of liquid, which may improve oral control, reduce premature oral and pharyngeal spillage, allowing an infant more time to organize their sex swallow breathe pattern, trigger a swallow for airway closure, and reduce the risk of aspiration. In the clinical practice guide, table nine has a list of common thickeners with product specifications, general mixing information, and recommendation, recommendations for use based on available literature for the thickening agent. Product ordering information is also available on the PEAS website uh, under the interactive equipment list. We have also included some information related to the use of starch-based thickeners and polyethylene glycol laxatives that are known to interact, leading to thinning of thickened drinks and liquids. All children with a pediatric feeding disorder benefit from a nutrition assessment as they are at greater risk of malnutrition and nutrition deficiencies, as Dr. Turner mentioned. Oral nutrition support strategies to optimize food, fluid, and nutrient intake are often needed to support adequate growth and optimize health. Strategies may vary based on the child's age, medical condition, current skill set, psychosocial factors, and current intake, but we also want to reflect the individual taste, culture, budget, and lifestyle of the child and family. In the CPG, you will find useful tools such as this algorithm to support decision making. And if the child is safe for oral intake, we can consider what our options are to optimize oral nutrition support, such as a high calorie protein diet, texture modification, and or thickened drinks and liquids, oral nutrition supplements, or other strategies. If oral nutrition support is ineffective, Enteral nutrition may be considered as an additional or alternative therapeutic management strategy. 
And sometimes a combination of oral and enteral feeds is needed to support the child to grow and improve their health, which in turn may facilitate safer swallowing and feeding skill progression. In the CPG, we have outlined when enteral feeds should be considered, focusing on airway protection, intestinal function, growth, and nutrition adequacy. And if oral feeding is no longer safe, possible, or adequate, collaborative decision-making between the interdisciplinary team and family is recommended to determine the optimal feeding route, type, and duration of enteral feeding. Oral feeding or stimulation should continue to be offered if safe and appropriate. The working group collaborated with physicians to create this decision-making tree, which emphasizes that nasoenteric tubes are intended to be temporary. And although controversial, research suggests that children have better feeding-related outcomes when we are cognizant of how long they've had their tube. Consideration of gastrostomy insertion is highly recommended when enteral feeding is expected to extend beyond 4 to 12 weeks. Physicians and the interdisciplinary team should provide information and guidance to parents and children as appropriate early in the treatment process to assist and support their decision making. As there are risks to both long-term nasogastric tube use and gastrostomy tube insertion, it is essential to consider in collaboration with the family, the child's medical needs, overall health, the ability to safely consume oral intake, and recent progress with feeding skills, and together determine the best option for the child in the short term and the long term as applicable. Facilitating feeding as a neurodevelopmental skill and relational process has been emphasized in the CPG when considering strategies for feeding skill development. Children with delayed or disoral, disordered oral reflexes will need individualized treatment techniques to facilitate oral sensory motor function. Promoting early recognition and response to cues, intervening to prevent distress and disengagement, making feeding opportunities manageable, enjoyable, and successful, and an overall positive feeding experience are reviewed in the CPG. PEAS has developed family education materials to support skill development, such as facilitating first tastes and introducing new foods to your child, additional handouts on food ideas by color, flavor, and texture, as well as food play and new foods step-by-step -step were adopted from nutrition services for multidisciplinary use. And as part of the project deliverables, PEAS inventoried family education materials to identify resources to adopt, adapt, or create to support consistent messaging, resource access, and education delivery. A large number of resources from Data Group, My Health Alberta, Nutrition Services, and from frontline clinicians were reviewed for alignment with the CPG. And PEAS adopted over 30 resources for family education in the areas of dysphagia, texture modified diets, feeding skill development, nutrition, tube feeding, oral health autism spectrum disorder, and equipment and supplies. Um, so more recently, PEAS adapted and created several new family education materials. Aspiration, Is My Child at Risk? was a collaboration with Holland Bloorview. Gagging in Babies and Children to support families who may be concerned about their child's gagging and need guidance on when to be concerned. Um, often babies are recommended to feed in a sideline position, either at hospital discharge or in the community, and our new handout will support parents to understand when to do this, have a visual on proper positioning, and to offer guidance on when they can consider transitioning to a more traditional cradle hold. And although Healthy Parents, Healthy Children offers information on feeding cues, our team felt the need to have a more targeted resource available on our website with a feeding-focused lens. Your baby's first tastes and introducing new foods to your child handouts were really born out of a need to support families where the introduction of food may not follow a typical introduction timeline. And these are intended to support infants and children with a pediatric feeding disorder where the steps to introduce foods may require a gentler and more gradual approach. We have also adopted a video to reflect normal swallowing, we have adapted uh, the Thick Fluid Handout from Nutrition Services for patients with dysphagia to have a pediatric focus. 
Uh, we are just in the process of finalizing a provincial suite of tube feeding resources with both a general booklet and tube specific handouts, uh, as well as we have adopted tube feeding videos from the home nutrition support programs. And most recently, uh, we adapted the home blended food for tube feeding uh, resources that were developed by the Alberta Children's Hospital dietitians. PEAS collaborated with families to develop a family life and self-care section, which, as Mona mentioned, addresses the reality of stress and anxiety families face when they have a child with special needs. And it offers resources for accessing formal and informal supports, such as mental health, sibling support networks, and social media outlets such as Facebook. So I also encourage you to visit this page on the website. Tricia will now provide us with an overview of interprofessional care. Good morning. Thank you, Melissa. I will highlight the P's work regarding interprofessional collaboration and the imperative and influential role of uh, pediatricians, family physicians on team collaboration to optimally support the child and family. On behalf of my co-chair partners, Vanessa Stanky and Melanie madison Dewar. This graphic illustrates the goals of the PEACE project with respect to building strong collaborative teams and enhancing coordination of care and communication within eating, feeding, and swallowing area of practice. The feedback from the PEACE rural cafes indicated a disjointed or siloed current state with teams separated by their discipline, geographic area, or even clinical program within the same site. Our goal is to provide teams with the evidence-based research and information and tools to help build care teams that are centered around the child and family and operating under a shared goal of best patient care with fluid communication between all members of the team. We can truly benefit from pediatricians and family physicians promoting those patient outcomes through interprofessional care, bringing together the unique perspective of varied disciplines, regardless of whether people work in co-located teams or are geographically spread out. As part of the roles, descriptors, and tasks within full scope tools, we've developed a diagram that addresses roles as shown here on the left, outlining the multiple and different care providers, such as the dietitian, OT, SLP, psychologists, pediatricians, physicians, and others. There are different training and skills, and that central pivotal role of the family in the interdisciplinary care. We purposefully blurred the colors between the professions, acknowledging that there are shared areas of practice among team members. The diagram on the left is the healthcare provider vernacular related to eating, feeding, swelling roles. And the diagram on the right is created for family understanding of various roles. A great example of creating a collaborative care plan. So one plan instead of plans from every discipline, it's been adapted for use across pediatric eating and swallowing services and programs is the goal wheel. The center of the goal wheel is the family centered goal statement and the shared decision-making process is used to identify the actions, tasks, strategies that will enable progress toward that goal. Actions are strategies that can be suggested by all of the disciplines involved with the family, with the physician and or pediatrician being the critical team member to support that collaborative perspective and support the child and family. This goal wheel provides an example of how we can document goal setting in a way that supports the collaborative process. The family and providers have a shared understanding of the overarching goal and the actions or tasks associated. The goal wheel is a coordinated group effort approach to care. So I'll pass it over to Mona to walk us through the goal wheel. Thanks, Tricia. Um, so this is an example of a goal wheel that we used um, that the team helped me to work through. So our goal was, I want to be able to sit together as a family for mealtime with everyone participating. And um, feeding was a great effort. It included every single one of our clinicians on our multidisciplinary team. Before the assistance of the clinicians, my, my goal would have looked 
would have been something different. It would have said, like, I want Isha to eat supper. But they were able to reframe it and include the whole family, which I really loved. And so um, there was, you know, different actions that we could follow. So the OT recommended we purchase appropriate seating so Isha could sit independently. The behavioral consultant um, showed us ways to include her siblings, her siblings to make a game out of it, get her using utensil, utensils. So, um, you know, how we praise all our kids and not Isha. SLP helped us with jaw alignment and um, they noticed, you know, some of the things, some of the items were just for me, not even Isha. It was like, mom does not sit with her kids at meals. Uh, she tends to stand and hover and cook. And so there was some things that I needed to do to act as a positive role model. And so having a cohesive plan laid out for us, something like this worked really well. We could bring this document to our pediatrician or to maybe another therapist who wasn't part of our team. And so that was just a really great reference for us to carry around and use. We could pick and choose what action we might want to implement at, you know, at one meal and that might change to, from another, like from, from day to day. And so this using this goal wheel was really a contrast from our previous experience when therapists didn't know each other and they worked in silos. And, you know, sort of the, the knowledge between all the clinicians, they allowed the, their expertise to spill into each other's domains and every appointment would build and build and build. And so uh, things moved a lot faster and gave us a lot of opportunity to practice as a family. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mona. Finally, we wanted to share the feeding care plan template that can be used in tandem with the goal wheel, depending on the teams and, and where they're located and, you know, whether it's more of an acute phase um, service or community phase. The feeding care plan supports the family and team in documenting a decision for the child's oral feeding. The plan can be found on the PEAS website and can be used by every discipline on the child's care team, including the physician, pediatrician, who clearly can support the collaborative approach for safe care. So this concludes our presentation for today. Please consider subscribing to upcoming news and events through the PEAS website and subscribing to the Community of Practice. The AHS PEAS Community of Practice is available to all healthcare team members, including pediatricians, family physicians, interested in building community and to capture the spirit and harness the power of collaboration to enhance and improve that interdisciplinary practice for eating, feeding, and swallowing. You can also contact PEAS uh, via the email that you see on the screen. And just to, again, um, say that you are such a critical team member and a leader for children's eating, feeding, swallowing teams, and we celebrate your imperative influence as pediatricians, uh, family physicians on collaborative interprofessional care. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our presentation and where uh, we'll welcome your questions or comments.